Okay, I know that it is early, but like, I mean, even during worship, I mean, this was amazing killer worship. We never had this worship in youth, in the youth group, never had this worship in college, and y'all are kind of dead. So when Glenn's like, how are we? Eh. It is Tuesday morning. We are alive. We are free. We have 10, most of us have 10 fingers and 10 toes. And um, I say most because I know there's some places where people had some tragic poor baby accidents. But you are in the house of God, which means that you are loved, anointed, and redeemed. And for that fact in and of itself, can we just say, thank you, Jesus. Okay, good. So we're warming up. It is an honor and a privilege to be here because, uh, back on campus specifically, because this is the place of my very first job. I worked in um, the swim center at the pool when I was 16 years old, a sophomore at La Mirada High School, and I loved it. And uh, my boss loved me. I was kind of like the favorite child of the pool family. And he said, why don't you just keep your key so you can, um, when you return next summer, you can... Uh, just have access to the pool again. Awesome. Well, when you're 16 and you have access to a pool, um, you and your friends think, well, let's go night swimming. What other place will you come to go night swimming than Biola, because I had the key. And apparently, it's still breaking and entering if you have the key, because the last memory I have on this campus is being escorted off campus by campus security for breaking and entering to the pool. So I am blessed that they allowed me to come back. Glenn, I don't even think you knew that. Maybe he wouldn't have invited me if he knew that that's the truth. But. Before we get started, um, there are a couple things I want to tell you about myself. Like Glenn said, my name is Bianca Wattis Oltoff. I was married, thank you, Jesus, about two years ago. I mean, I was, I was hitting 30, and for a Hispanic woman, if, if you're 21 and not married with like 18 kids, people think there's something wrong with you. So um, I am married. I have a wonderful husband. Um, I work for the A21 campaign. We are an anti-human trafficking organization that has seven offices in six different countries, and we have the audacious goal of abolishing the injustice of slavery in the 21st century. So it is exciting and I'm passionate because I believe that justice is so part and parcel of the gospel message. Secondly, um, I am Hispanic and I am a female, so if I talk fast and wave my hands and get emotional, maybe even cry, just ignore me, it's what I do. And uh, third, I married a good the German man, so no matter what, we will get out on the time because he's very good with the schedule. So we will all be getting to class today on time. And uh, yeah, with that, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we just want to center ourselves on you. Nothing else matters right now, God. We are in your house, and because you are here, your word says where two or more are gathered, you are there in the midst, and God, we believe that you are here. So we press into, into you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for this time. And God, I personally want to thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you here today, uninhibited. May you speak loudly to our hearts. Convict us in areas that need to be convicted in. But more of that, more than that, God, I pray that there is a transformation of our heart, of our mind, and our soul. In your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, justice is an important concept to me. What is just, what is right, what is fair, what should be. Scripture on the screen is Galatians 3.28 that we're all very familiar with. There is neither Jew nor Greek neither slave nor free, neither, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. I'm dyslexic in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to be called a heretic at the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Let's get that right. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now let's make sure that we are all on the same page. So we all come on the same page. This is our launching pad for understanding. And um, just kind of acknowledge that racism and prejudice still exist within our nation and around the globe. Um, the marches, the conferences, and the rallies of the, the 60s provided such a great change in the cultural landscape and tapestry of America. But they amended society's actions. And though that's great, I think we need to move beyond that and realize that it's, it's, it's bigger than just actions. It's the intentions of the heart that we as the church need to address. Now, I, I know that this is Reconciliation Chapel. I spoke to Glenn a little bit about that, but I wanna be really careful that this isn't like some special talk that we give about racial reconciliation because that's not what it's about. This is part and part of the gospel. This is the word of God, that there is no difference. No, not that we're colorblind, because we do see colors and that's important. But that we recognize that this issue is of the heart, and, and, and today, 
statistically speaking, there's a disparity in America. The stats will tell us that the average income for American white family is $113,000. The average typical income for a Hispanic family is $6,325. And the typical income for a black family is $5,677. There's a disparity, would you not agree? If you don't agree with that statistic, you can take that up with the Pew Council for Research because that's where the statistics came from and that's from 2011. But that disparity in the cultural landscape of America also plays itself out in academia. For instance, here on this campus, 58% of students who attend Biola are white. And no, I'm not going to use the word Caucasian because unless you're from the Caucasus Mountains, I will call you Caucasian. But most people, by and large, in America are white, just as I will not refer to people as African American because not everyone who is black is from Africa. So not, I'm, not, I'm trying actually to be PC by using these categories. So I'm putting these statistics and the disparities up on the screen not to feel like I'm an oppressed, oppressed woman of color that's just oppressed by the hand of man in the US. That's not what it's about. Oh, wow, you guys are laughing? I wasn't even trying to be funny. That's great. I'm going to go home and tell my husband that you all and Viola think I'm funny. He doesn't think so. What I'm simply advocating, he says, Bianca, if you have to laugh at yourself, you're not funny. I laugh at myself all the time. So I am not saying that we should rise up in arms and say, this is, this, this is what we need to do. We need to open up enrollment. I, I, it has nothing to do with it. I'm simply asking the question, why? If we ask the question why, it roots us into justice. Now, I know that my experience within church and also within ministry is probably different from a lot of your, from a lot of your experiences and different from most people. Uh, again, as a Hispanic, I had to wrestle with being bicultural, bilingual, bisocial. I, so I grew up and I so desperately wanted to be American, like American-American. But being an American meant acting like the majority, embracing a new set of values, and shedding all the things that were uniquely me. Now, while my friends at church who were loving, they were very loving people, but I grew up in a church that, again, was predominantly white, and this isn't a white issue. I married a white man, for crying out loud. It's not a white issue. I'm pointing out some obvious things. For me, as a kid growing up, my friends spoke about eating peas and carrots, and I went home and ate rice and beans. When people were talking about Wonder Bread, I ate tortillas. And instead of seeing uh, the beauty in, well, most kids were trying to hang out with their parents or not be by their parents, I was trying to wrestle with trying to convince my dad the pronunciation for sandwich is not sandwich, okay? And my daddy's here, I'm not trying to embarrass him, it's the truth. So this is kind of the cultural context in which I grew up. And at a young age, I could see a set of values in our family that were different from other families. Um, instead of seeing these individual values as inherently good and awesome and of worth and value, I was looked at differently by people I grew up with. And because of that, our American dream looked different. But the truth of the matter is, we were different. I grew up as a first-generation American. My father was uh, brought here to the country illegally at the age of eight, and he stayed here in the beautiful country, the United States of America. And when Vietnam rang forth to the ears of young men roughly about your age, my dad stood up and said, I love this country and I want to fight for this country. And so he went and signed up to fight in the war, and, and the officer who was there at the um, office for application had said, son, can I have your documentation? My dad says, I don't have any. And the, so you don't have your documentation, you're not a legal citizen. My dad says, no. He said, well, son, if you're willing to die for this country, we're willing to make you a citizen. So my dad signed up to be a United States Marine hoorah, in, uh, many, many years ago. Um, radical encounters with God. He was tore up from the floor up, needed Jesus, had an encounter, come to the moment, Jesus with Christ. And there was a call of ministry upon his life, which took him back to the place where he wanted to run from, which was the hood in East Los Angeles. Well, um, he met this fine-looking Puerto Rican woman. They get married, and the call of ministry was upon both of their life. But if you grew up in ministry, you know ministry. Ministry sometimes comes at a financial sacrifice. I catch my breath. I know I'm with y'all. I don't talk fast. You just listen slow, so hang on. So 
During that time, there was a lot of financial sacrifices that came into our family's life because my dad felt this call of ministry. We lived in a low-income area of predominantly minority families, and it was some beautiful moments of family bonding and utter dependence on God, but I know what it feels like to be ostracized. I know what it feels like to be marginalized. I know what it feels like to be the other. And I was talking to my father, and I bring this up because I think it's hilarious and I share it quite often, but I was reminiscing about our time growing up and how God was just this God of the impossible and he provided great things. And I said, yeah, I, I remember being poor. And he said, Bianca, we weren't poor. You're right, Daddy, we were poor. We couldn't even afford the OR on the end of that. You know you poor when your neighbors give you their government-issued food. You know you poor when you're shopping at the thrift store and the bargain bin. I so desperately as a kid wanted to be fabulous and I was more like fabulous. I came from a family where we were the people that church dropped off boxes of clothes and food and presents during Thanksgiving and Christmas. That was my family. Couple this with the fact that the schools in our area were not great. My parents made a conscious decision they were gonna home educate us. Any homeschoolers in the house? Yeah, we're all weird, we're all weird. We're all weird, at least we can own it, it's all good. Well, my mom was a bohemian, laissez-faire, tree-hugging hippie that was like, my kids are just gonna learn and it's gonna be awesome. Well, I was 11 years old and I still couldn't read. So I'm living in this environment, I can't read, I am about four foot six, um, trying to process what happiness felt like, what being made fun of felt like, and all this other stuff. I dove into food, which is what I, 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 I do, and at the tender age of 11, with long, unkept hair and freckles and big, thick glasses, I weighed 178 pounds, which was more than my father. See, statisticians would put me in a category highest prone to failure. First generation American, Hispanic, poorly educated, poor, obese, a female full of guilt and shame. Girls like me don't end up teaching chapel at Biola. Girls like me don't end up graduating graduate school with a 4.0. Girls like me don't fight human trafficking around the globe. No. Girls like me, according to statisticians, end up pregnant, unwed, two or three different kids from two or three different baby daddies living on welfare, caught up with gangs and drugs, broken and hopeless. But I am here to tell you that there is something much greater than facts, much greater than statistics, and it's called the Word of God. Ooh, I got an amen? Because that's the truth. No, that's the truth with a double F. That's the truth right there because I have the word of God in my hands and the word of God tells me that I am called, I'm anointed, I'm redeemed, that there's a plan and a purpose for my life. That before I was in my mother's womb, he knew me. And when I was in my mother's womb, he formed me. That is the God that I serve. It's 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. The Lord does not look at the things that we look at, the color of our skin, our gender, our location, our demographic, our financial account, our pedigree, our history. That's what the world looks at. What does God look at? People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And as part of this generation, I'm not much older than you, but I am older than you. Why are you laughing, Ma? As part of this generation, at the end of mine, the beginning of yours, from social media to university philosophy classes and the gap in between, most 20-somethings have a different concept or a concept of embracing difference. And this is why I believe that this generation can impact the future history of the church. Globaliza globalization has made our world much, much smaller. Technology allows us to communicate on the other side of the world in a, in a, in a nanosecond. Pop culture connects us transnationally. Well, when Americans can identify Cristiano Ronaldo's abs from merely a picture and girls in Japan are suffering from Bieber fever, the world is getting much, much smaller. But why don't we see this in church? To be embraced or accepted in many large churches, you either have to uh, look like the church or act like those in the church. So we become homogenized. I am a Christian. I look like you. I worship like you. Soon Ron Cha says in, in his book, New Evangelicalism, says the most segregated day of the week is Sunday. Oh, people, that should not be. That should not be. We are naturally attracted to things that look like us and things that make us feel safe and people that we connect with, and I'm not arguing against that. 
But that's easy. When did building a church culture and community become about easy? When did it become about comfort and homogeneity? Homo I can never pronounce that word, but you know what I'm saying. We all look the same. When did creating a, cult a, a church culture or campus culture look like that? When did it become about feeling uneasy, uh, uh, cha unchallenging, easy, and simple? If we are modeling our life after Christ, I think it is imperative and important that we follow his role. If we believe that we are Christians, if we are Christ-like, if we are followers of Christ, we should follow the role of Christ. One of the most important relationships that I see and that I love, and I do believe that the Holy Spirit has uh, given me this word to share because Glenn will be sharing about Samaritans later on in class today, which is the topic of today and even leading up into this point. Most relationships that I see in scripture are beautiful. Christ loved the marginalized, awesome. Christ loved the sick, awesome. Christ loved women, awesome. Christ dealt with people who were demon possessed and that is great, but I am wildly, wildly fascinated with the relationship between Jesus and the Samaritans. There's this, this great polarity between these two cultures and this hatred stems back all the way to Jacob of the Old Testament, a well and property given to Joseph in the place that Joseph was to be buried. I need you to hang tight. We're going to go through 1,000 years of biblical history in about mm, five or ten minutes, so hang tight. Gerizim is where the altars have been constructed that we read about in the book of Deuteronomy, where the Israelites worship. But in 722 uh, BC, the Assyrians, who hated the Jews, the plight of the Jews even now today, um, wanted to destroy and invade the land, and they conquered the people who are known today as Jews. Even, even today, when the land is captured in war, what, is, what happens? They go and take intelligentsia, they kill them off. They want the intelligent people gone and done away with. They export people, they transport people, and they deport people. Well, that's what the Assyrians tried to do in every way, committing a genocide to a religion and ethnicity. But it didn't come to pass. There were some Jews who remained as refugees in the land, and their homes were taken away from them, and their crops were taken away from them. This was done so that their heritage would be cut off. Their identity and their religious faith would be dead. Are you tracking with me? Should I speak Spanish? <laughs> Give me a head nod. Okay, great. This is the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. I need you guys to hold on to your underwear because this is going to put into context one of the parables that every single one of us knows. So the remaining Jews had a crit critical decision. Do we hold on to the faith of God or do we uh, syncretize our faith? Do we join in and mix and marry? We're told in 2 Kings 17 that they did intermarry and they did mix their beliefs with that of the Assyrians and they worshiped false gods. Now, it, it, it got confusing when they began to sacrifice the children to the Assyrian gods while still believing in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So they're duplicitous in their faith, they're duplicitous in their belief, and they claim to be descendants of Abraham, which they were, but they were just so confused about who they were worshiping and how they were living. Years later, the Jews were captured, who were captured were freed, and they went back to the land. Now, they attempted to rebuild their community and rebuild their identity and their religion. But we are told in Ezra and Nehemiah that when they wanted to go back and rebuild the temple, um, the Samaritans wanted to join in, and their Jewish brothers said, no way, you are mixed, you are different, you are not us anymore, we want nothing to do with you, you filthy inbreeds, you are condemned for it forever. Our relationship, you used to be my homie, you used to be my brother, now, nope, I don't know you. They built up proverbial walls around them and that separated them. The country of Israel is long like this. It's broken up into three centers, the north, the middle, and the south. And Samaria was right in the middle. Now, that, of course, did not go over with the Samaritans. An act of retaliation, a renegade Jew, uh, sees the opportunity to rally the Samaritans. He was like, no, we, this is our land. This is what we're going to do. And so he married a Samaritan woman, and he went to Mount Gerizim. And he said, we don't need Jerusalem. We don't need that temple. We're going to make our own temple. 
So what was kind of the unstated synchronizing of two different religions became official. Well, animosity and hatred set in, and about 300 years later, the Jews are so sick of the lies, they're so sick of the hatred, they walk to Samaria, through Sikar, up to Mount Gerizim, and destroy the temple. It's war, guys. This is bigger than the Hatfield and McCoys. It's wider than the segregation gap of the black between whites in the 1950s. This is more dangerous than the Bloods and the Crips of South LA, and this is more dramatic than Little Kim and Nicki Minaj. Really, I mean, this is some bad stuff. 120 years later, Jesus Christ is on the scene. There is still hatred. There's still racial tension. There's still cultural and ethnic differences. There's religious differences. Re racism towards the Samaritans, Jews who were unloving, unforgiving, unbending hatred from the Samaritans to the Jews and the Jews to the Samaritans. If you were a good Jew, uh, all of a sudden I'm from New York, if you're a good Jew, if you're a good Jew and you had to go to Judea, you didn't go through Samaria. You would tack on additional three to four days and go around Samaria because you didn't want to be around the filthy pigs. There was quite possibly nothing worse than those people. Oh, those people. That's what's going on here. And I gave you about 1,000 years of biblical history in about seven minutes. Hallelujah. Hang on. I think I broke a sweat. Okay. So I do this to set the scene that history is imperative, that history is so important because we kind of glaze over scriptures, but I want you to understand the gnarly craziness that is going on during that time. They, they hatred, there was bigotry, there was racism, there was prejudice in the land towards people that were the same, much like there is today. There is very few differences between the melanin count in my skin and your skin and somebody else's skin, but our internal, our heart, we break for the same things. We're wounded over the same things. We want to the same things. On many levels, we are connected on so many times, and so when I put that history into context, and we're not gonna go through the Good Samaritan because every single one of us, I'm gonna safely assume, have heard the story of the Good Samaritan. Well, we talk about the Good Samaritan like it's nothing, but you need to understand that this was appalling to the Jews, appalling. A Samaritan? You are gonna say that a Samaritan is better than us? And it was a parable, Jesus spoke in story. What I love here is that the priest and the Levite, both Jews, were too busy to fulfilling their religious obligational duty that they didn't stop and help the man who was beat up on the street. Now, Jesus allowed his life to be interrupted. Jesus took care, oh, excuse me, uh, the Good Samaritan allowed his life to be interrupted. He stopped what he was doing. He used his resources to meet a need. I see that exact thing going on in John chapter four with the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus didn't go around the city. He went through the city. And not only did Jesus go through the city, he went through Samaria and he was talking to a Samaritan and not just a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman. Do you understand the cultural context? This was a no-no, Jesus was a rabbi. This is not what the good people do. We don't do that, we don't cross the street, we don't talk to those people. Really? Jesus did. So should we. He spoke so clearly into her life, such a clear, God-ordained, life-breathing word into her life. I know that you're not married to the fool you're shacking up with right now. In fact, you had shacked up with a couple other men. Sir, I consider you to be a prophet. And then she plays the religious card to which Jesus says, no, we're not gonna do that. She had a radical encounter with God because he took the time. He crossed the street and he spoke life into her life. If we are called to be like Christ, what are we doing to break those cultural barriers or social norms or histories in our life that have been so connected to our family's upbringing or our family's belief. Jesus hung out with Samaritans. Jesus hung out with marginalized and disenfranchised. And Jesus lambasted the religious elite for their separation and hyper-religiosity. May that never be us. May that never be this generation. May it never be students of Viola who have known the truth and those who know the truth and do not do it. My friends, that is a sin. I don't 
I know that we aren't Jesus. I'm not claiming that we should start walking on water and turning water into wine. We are not Jesus. But are we even remotely trying to embody him? Are we remotely trying to leave our holy huddle of the Biola campus, our Bible bubble of the Biola campus, or we continue to speak Christianese to those on the outside? Turn or burn. How are you doing? Blessed. Are, how, how, how far are we willing to go to break off the shackles of, of a safety and comfortability and ease and go to the marginalized and disenfranchised, those who are in need? Now, society hasn't gotten this. Our culture has not gotten this. But this is the greatest hour of the church to rise up and echo the words of Paul to the Galatian church. There is neither Jew nor Greek, uh, slave nor free. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Now, culturally, the church, and this is not because I'm trying to uh, uh, bash the church. I love the church. The church is what gives me passion. It's, it's, it's the joie de vivre of my life. Like, I love God's people. I love God's people. But the church is about 10 to 15 years behind in music, media, culture, cool factor, per se. Now, if that's the case, why not step into the arena of race relations and unity and take the lead? We are looking for people like Dr. Martin Luther King who had a dream that one day, that one day is today and it's on your backs. It is on your timeline, it is on your watches for you to say, no, we as a church are not gonna be colorblind, we're gonna be color bound as we stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers in Christ who may look differently, who speak differently, act differently, but are my brothers in Christ because before they were born, Christ had a call and a destiny upon their life and I too am a child of God and because of that, I'm gonna link arms with you and we are gonna progress and we're gonna change this world for good. As a Christian, a university full of passionate students who want to change the world, I, I leave you with these three things that we can do. To have acute awareness, an acute awareness of reaching in to those who are around us in our own communities who maybe look or act like us here on the Biola campus, it's an in-reach. It's us connecting in community with each other. But those on the outside or perhaps look different from us, first of all, let me stop and pause on that, on that in thing. I don't know the cultural context here at Biola. I don't know if there's racial tension. I would hope and pray to God that there isn't, but all of us have some sort of ill prejudice in our heart. All of us have made a racial slur at one time or another. And that's a gross overstatement, I know. Maybe you are the select chosen, frozen chosen one who has not you know, said that, but I am guilty of that myself. And so before I can even move on, I feel very convicted in confessing to you that I am sorry. I am sorry for being indignant. I am sorry for being upset with the church and people who marginalize me simply from some, something that I couldn't control myself, which is the color of my skin. I am sorry for being angry and frustrated with the church. I apologize, and for us to go further as a church, I think we need, we owe ourselves and we owe each other an apology. I'm sorry for not understanding your cultural context. I'm sorry for judging you on the color of your skin and not the content of your character, like Dr. Martin Luther said, Dr. Martin Luther King. We need to inreach, to get on our face, to get on our knees and say, God, you need to help me understand. This is the beginning of justice, that we see a value in every single person and in every single life. Amen? Then it's then, once we get this right, once we get church right, and that's church with a capital C, and once we get church right, then we do an outreach where we reach out and meet with those not like us who don't, maybe don't think like us or maybe don't believe in the things that we believe, an acute awareness. And lastly, once we get right, once we get right with our neighbor, then we reach up. Reach in, reach out, and reach up. Praising God and thanking God that we are unified, glorious body of Christ that wants to go out and rock the world in his name. That is your responsibility. That is your responsibility. That is your responsibility. And maybe the very thing that is keeping you from the calling and destiny that God has put on your life is your bigotry, your hatred, your prejudice towards your brother or sister in Christ. 
And this goes deeper than the color issue. Like, I'm going to remove the color issue. This is part and parcel of the gospel. If you have a problem with your brother, if you have a problem with your sister, you need to confront them like Matthew 18, 15 tells us. And not go, oh, let's pray for so-and-so because you know what she did? No, that's you going to your sister. It's you going to your brother. You asking for forgiveness of sin because if there is sin in your heart, it's going to inhibit you from doing what God has called you to do. Who does not want to fulfill their destiny? Who does not want to fill their call in their life? Raise your hand. Exactly, none of us do. In order to reach our utmost potential for Jesus Christ, I think part of the component is recognizing that we have prejudice, we have judgment, and dare I say, racism to certain individuals. And so today, I just wanna pray that we can get right with God so we can get tight with God. Let's go ahead and stand in prayer. Like I said, I married a German. I am right on time. We are the good and tight. Father God, thank you so much for showing up. I pray that this is just a tidbit, a morsel of your goodness that makes us hungry for your word, God. We wanna dive into your word. We wanna have life transformation through the power of your word, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So go before our day today. May we radically change our campus, change our community, change the state, change this nation, ultimately change this world. In your name, Jesus, we pray, amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.